Right, welcome back. I want to thank Roger Berkowitz for giving me the opportunity to introduce Daniel Mendelssohn. It is an honor and a pleasure. Daniel Mendelssohn is the author of at least 10 books. I am not quite sure as actually I kept having to go back and recount because I missed one the first time. So, um, but you may also know him from his essays in the New Yorker, the New Yorker, New York Review of Books, or other places. He is the winner of many prizes and more of a general respect and regard across what one might call the intellectual community here and in Europe. But above all, his writing is beautiful, beautiful in its intellectual depth and its elegant structure. And that is why this is particularly an honor. It is a special and surprising pleasure because we share something I thought I shared with absolutely no one else, a childhood obsession with the work of Mary Renault. I hope to talk with, about that with you later. Um, welcome, Daniel Mendelssohn. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Anne. <clears throat> Tragedy and philia, the politics of friendship in Greek tragedy. <clears throat> For years, Roger Berkowitz has been asking me to speak at these conferences, and for years I have politely declined on the not preposterous grounds that I know nothing about Hannah Arendt, apart from what subscribers to some of the loftier New York-based publications know. My impulse to turn Roger down was only the more powerful this year when he sought to entice me into speaking on this year's theme, friendship, by saying nice things about some pieces I had written about what he tactfully referred to as male friendship. Ah, yes, I thought, the gay angle. But try as I might, I could not see a path forward to speaking about male friendship, gay or straight, in a way that would be appropriate to a conference dedicated to our great political philosopher. And so again, I politely declined. And then one morning, a few weeks after I had swiped Roger to the left once again, <laughs> I bumped into the Arendt Center's Philip Lindsay at a Taste Buds Cafe in Red Hook. Philip and I have had interesting discussions over the past couple of years about our shared interest in the relationship of grassroots community activity to democratic politics. In some of those conversations, I had shared with him some thoughts I have had, wearing my classicist hat, about the nature of ancient Athenian democracy and its relentless emphasis on communal civic activity, about the way in which political activity for the Athenian electorate, the demos, was concentric with so many other communal activities, religious, social, and indeed artistic. Apropos of the latter, I reminded him that both the agora, where the great speeches and debates over politics took place, and the theater were places where citizens listened to discourse about issues of great urgency to the city, not least about the relationship of the self to the larger community, whether family, clan, or polis, and I repeated to him the amusing anecdote that Herodotus shares in the first book of his histories about how the Persian, and Persian emperor Cyrus, deriding the Athenian institutions of free discourse among citizens who would meet in the Agora to deliver and argue political speeches, once declared that, quote, I have, I have never yet feared the kind of men who have a place set apart in the middle of the city in which they gather together to tell one another lies. Now, the theater of Dionysus, too, was a place in the middle of the city where men told lies. Lies in the sense that the dramas that unfolded there were fictional, but like all worthwhile fiction, lies that tell the truth, too. Anyway, for half an hour or so, Philip and I chatted, as one does in downtown Red Hook, about the appalling state of political discourse in the United States in the past few years, and the proverbial light bulb went off above my head. You see, when Roger had asked me to speak about friendship, I thought about the usual stuff, Netflix and chill, that sort of thing. 
But during my conversation with Philip, I started to think in Greek terms, not in the way the phrase male friendship might lead you to think, but more abstractly about, that is, philia, the Greek word often translated as friendship. But philia, along with its related noun philos, plural philoi, usually rendered as friend, means much more than that. Philos in Greek referred to anyone with shared interest. Your family, first of all, were your philoi, so were what we would call your friends, but so were your political allies, philoi. A good way to translate philoi, it has occurred to me recently, would be peeps. Philoi were the people to whom you were connected by all kinds of relationships, genetic, affective, emotional, intellectual, your circle, your peeps. It was when I started to think of philia in this way that it occurred to me, as a scholar of Greek tragedy, that I might have something to say of use, finally, to Roger. Because tragedy has much to say, as it happens, about, one what, about what one might call the politics of philia, a subject that might, after all, be appropriate for a Hannah Arendt conference. For much of Greek tragedy ponders the nature of philia, so often setting, as it does, different kinds of philoi against one another, struggles between parents and children, as in the Oresteia of Aeschylus, between siblings, as in the Antigone of Sophocles, between spouses, the Oresteia again, or Euripides Medea, between one kind of philia and another, or between different groups of philoi with their competing interests. Those competitions, as dramatically gripping as they may be, had political implications that were, I would venture to say, of even greater interest to the average Athenian theater goer than the drama did. For the polis itself depended on managing the tensions between kinds of philia in ways I shall describe shortly. And tragedy was, above all, a vehicle for working out those tensions in an artistic way. For many scholars, in fact, tragedy was, above all, a political institution. This may strike you as a strange claim. When we think about Greek tragedy, we think of the intense, even outsized emotions of individual characters acting out their anger or grief or resentments, the wounded Clytemnestra avenging the sacrifice of her virgin daughter Iphigenia by murdering her husband upon his triumphant return from the Trojan War, the spurned Medea taking her terrible revenge on her wayward husband, Sophocles' Ajax, humiliated by his worst enemy, Odysseus, impaling himself on his sword rather than face his shame, Euripides' Heracles, tricked by the gods into slaying his own family, eager to kill himself also, because of his shame. Those characters' extreme predicaments and the Baroque emotions they both arise out of and produce have made those plays and those characters irresistible to actors and audiences for the better part of three millennia, as we know. But it is worth remembering that the Greeks experienced tragedy as a civic event, a production put on by the polis, financed by the polis, and witnessed by the entire citizen body, the demos. The state's interest in having its citizens attend tragic performances is witnessed by <clears throat> the fact that the nominal entrance fee for the tragedies was subsidized by the government for people who could not afford it. All tragic performances took place as part of an annual civic festival that celebrated the Athenian state, its leaders, and its institutions. Before the plays were performed, prominent citizens who had benefited the state in some way were honored. Booty taken in the previous year's wars would be displayed before an appreciative public. Children of men who had lost their lives fighting for the Athenian state would be paraded before the audience. Only then would the plays be put on. And I might remind you as well that the plays, unlike the plays that we usually go to, were performed in broad daylight. The citizens watching the dramas 
were intensely aware of their fellow Athenians as those dramas unfolded. And indeed, the members of the chorus were ordinary citizens, like the audience, making an extreme kind of identification possible. And so the performance of the plays that we love for their drama would in fact have been heavily contextualized within a powerful politico-military framework for the Athenians. Clearly, the polis was invested in its theater in ways very foreign to the way that we experience theater, sitting anonymously in the dark, unaware of our surroundings. And here I should mention another fact worth keeping in mind, that the floroit of Athenian drama, for all Greek tragedy is Athenian, no other city produced it, was perfectly concentric with the heyday of Athenian democracy. The democracy was created in 509 BCE and collapsed just over 100 years later at the end of the Peloponnesian War. The genre of tragedy also began in the late 500s BCE when Thespis, in the immortal words of Addison DeWitt in All About Eve, first stepped out of the chorus line and also ended when the war did. Euripides' Bacchae premiered in 405, a year after that poet's death. Sophocles' Oedipus at Colonus, the last Athenian tragedy that we possess, was first presented in 401, also posthumously. So tragedy is, as it were, genetically connected in some way to democracy, at least as the Athenians saw it. How then does tragedy illuminate philia as a political value? The fact is that the intense struggles characteristic of the action in Greek tragedy often take the form of conflicts between different kinds of philia. The choices that characters make inevitably point to fault lines in the hierarchy of values by which we all live, values defined by which communities we belong to, which philoi we choose to identify with. When Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia in order to win favorable winds to sail to Troy and make war on the Trojans, the crime that haunts all three plays that constitute Aeschylus' Oresteia of 458 BC, he is choosing to elevate his political philia, his obligation to the Greek cause, to his fellow generals, to the masculine imperative to display military valor, over his affective and kinship philia, his ties to his wife and to their child. So to Creon in Sophocles' Antigone, by honoring the corpse of his fallen nephew Ateocles, defender of the city of Thebes during its civil war, and defiling the corpse of his other nephew, Polynices, who attempted to invade and sack the city, <clears throat> Creon elevates political philia over familial philia. Antigone herself, of course, is the inverse. Her single-minded sense of duty to honor religious and family obligations compels her to elevate her philia to her kin over philia to the polis, a choice complicated deliciously by the fact that the king of this polis is also a member of her kinship group, her uncle. Such complications are a particular specialty of Athenian tragedy, forcing us, as it does, to reveal our deepest values by compelling us to acknowledge where, in the end, our profoundest sympathies lie. Euripides' Medea, which I think it's important to remember, premiered in the same Mediterranean spring that saw the beginning of the Peloponnesian War in 431 BC, is not a play we normally think of at all as being political. And yet Euripides constructs his plot ingeniously so as to force his heroine, who, it's worth remembering, is not Greek, but what the Athenians would have referred to as a barbarian. She is an Asian princess. He constructs his plot so as to force his heroine to redefine philia in terrible new ways. Her children, she acknowledges, are her closest philoi. There is no level of philia more intense than that of the nuclear family. 
but because they are also the children of the man who has become her worst enemy, her husband Jason, they are now also her enemies, Echthroi. And so, following the dreadful logic that stems from that calculus, she follows the heroic code and slays them. For the definition of heroic action for the Greeks was, quote, to help one's friends, Philoi, and harm one's enemies, Echthroi. It was Euripides' idea, I should mention, to make Medea the murderer of her children. In earlier versions of the myth, it appears that the spurned wife flees the city with her children. That he makes her the murderer of her own Philoi points to the vital urgency of the Philos Echthros friend enemy conundrum as it operated in Athenian thought. This analysis of Euripides' play leads to a consideration of the tragic treatment of Philia more directly to, related to the question of how politics might be related to friendship. Can an enemy become a friend as well as the other way around? Is Philia commutable, adaptable? Certainly, as I hardly need point out in today's political climate, rigid adherences to group allegiance, an extreme form of philia, we might say, to the detriment of all other considerations, is a threat to democratic processes and political discourse. <clears throat> this question is in fact taken up in Sophocles' Ajax, a play I mentioned earlier, and one which, for our purposes, has particularly interesting implications. In that play, Odysseus starts out as Ajax's worst enemy. The two of them have fought over who would be the recipient of the dead Achilles' armor, and, a and sorry, Odysseus wins the armor through cheating. <clears throat> In that play, Odysseus, we, see, we watch as Odysseus rejoices to see his divine patroness, Athena, scheme to humiliate Ajax by addling his wits in a particularly awful way. When Ajax, who has, just, who has a justified grudge against his commanding officers, Agamemnon and Menelaus, tries to avenge himself upon them, the goddess deceives him into attacking some livestock instead and the deluded hero tortures and eventually slays the poor cattle, only to learn, to his enormous shame, of his terrible and humiliating error. As a result, he kills himself. What is interesting for our purposes is the ending of the play. By this point, both Agamemnon and Menelaus, a la Creon in the Antigone, refused to bury the body of the man who had plotted to kill them. Surprisingly, it is Odysseus who suddenly speaks up in defense of his former enemy, warning the two generals about their impiety. Incredulously, they ask whether Odysseus has made a philos of his old echthros, a friend of his old enemy, and he replies that yes, he has. It is in the service of his current goal. Here, the larger consideration, proper religious observance, burying a grudge that by now has become moot, takes precedence over a narrower view of philia. This interest in the political potential of redefining what philia and philoi might mean surfaces interestingly in other plays. But before I discuss my last example and move to my conversation with Anne, I want to offer another historical tidbit that provides very interesting context for our conversation today. In 508, a year after the Athenian democracy was established, the Athenian leader Cleisthenes instituted a number of important reforms, the most noteworthy of which were the so-called Cleisthenic reforms to reorganize the structure of Athenian citizenship. Athenians had long identified themselves according to which of the four ancient ethnic Ionian tribes they belonged to. In his effort to break the psychological and historical grip that these tribal alliances, 
these alliances to the genetic phil philia <clears throat> exerted on the citizens, Cleisthenes established 10 new tribes, organized not by kinship, but by geographical location. Democracy, that is to say, has to find ways of disrupting primitive notions of philia by replacing them with other, more abstract kinds of affinities. This preoccupation with the dark force of primitive allegiances is, of course, the subject of Aeschylus's great trilogy, the Oresteia, which dramatizes the evolution of vengeance into justice. The trilogy, which begins with Clytemnestra's murder of her husband, one kind of philos, in revenge for his murder of their daughter, a crime we learn early on that is just the latest in a chain going back generations, ends with the establishment of a law court and a system of justice, an abstraction, that is to say, meant to replace the tit-for-tat personal vengeance that stems from narrow considerations of what it means to be a philos. I hardly need mention that one only need look at recent history to see that the pattern Aeschylus implicitly condemns continues to wreak its horrors in the modern world. In this context, I want to mention my final play, Euripides' Heracles. This is not as well known as the other works I have mentioned this afternoon, but it too shows a striking interest in what I am calling the politics of philia. In that play, Heracles, who has a nominal human father, Amphitryon, although we know that his genetic father is in fact Zeus, the king of the gods, slaughters his own family after being deluded in a manner very similar to what we saw in the case of Ajax. Upon waking from his berserker fury, frenzy, <clears throat> he is so overcome by shame that he intends to kill himself. He has become, after all, an exemplar of miasma, ritual pollution, and has become an untouchable. At that moment, Theseus, the king of Athens, who had once benefited from the great hero's bravery, enters the action. He persuades Heracles to come back to Athens with him. Friendship, he says, philia, is stronger than any religious pollution. In Athens, he says, his old ally can have a new life among new philoi, a new city, new connections, new friends. What Theseus the Athenian does in the play, in other words, is to redefine philia before our eyes, as drastic a redefinition of that term as we get in Greek tragedy. As Heracles follows the king off stage, he muses that the kindly Amphitryon and not Zeus must be his true father, a striking symbolic rejection of the genetic for the emotional reality. Here then, an explicit association is being made among redefining philia, the abandonment of kinship in favor of a more abstract way of thinking about one's identity <clears throat> and political identity. If we are to survive and go on, Euripides seems to be saying, we must be able to jettison old notions, old allegiances, and adapt our thinking about what philia might really mean. Plus a change, I would say. And now I hope to be able to talk about some of the implications of these very old plays with Anne. Thank you. Questions and, cons and in your interest. I must shorten them. Um, I think my first question, which didn't, I didn't intend to be my first question, is so many of the Greek plays, you spoke about how they help the Athenians work things out politically. And yet, when I think of those plays, things don't work out very well in them at all. I mean, <coughs> even, even Ajax, he's dead. There's, there was no resolution. The humanities are just pointed outwards in the Oresteia, so that the enmity they once had within, they now don't have. And, well, 
Well, I think when I say work out, I mean not necessarily solve, but but I, maybe work through is a better way of expressing. I mean, I think the the kinds of debates that we see, you know, Greek tragedy loves to pit uh, characters against one another in these very rat a tat tatty kind of debates, the the agon, uh, and I think they were very much like the debates the Athenians were were watching in their political life. Uh, and, and so I think it's actually more fruitful not to have worked it out in the sense of solving it, but to show that political discourse is constituted, or healthy political discourse is constituted by the ability to both say one's own piece and listen to the other person's piece. What's interesting in Greek tragedy and what makes for the, what we would call the tragic part of tragedy is that what's often dramatized is something we're very familiar with, which is that each side thinks its truth is the entire truth. So for example, to take the play that most people are familiar with, Antigone, as I never tire of pointing out to my students, Antigone is just as bad as Creon. She thinks her vision of the right, which is her allegiance to her family, is the entire cookie. And he thinks that the state is the entire cookie. And neither one is capable of acknowledging that it may be more complicated than that. And that's why they both end up miserable, as you point out, at the end of the play. And I say, so I think by sort of staging what are essentially political debates in a dramatic way, uh, it allows the citizens of Athens to, to contemplate the, I would say, the importance of the debate. There's a reason that the state supported these, these performances. You know, it's not accidental. Would it be possible to say that what the Athenians are seeing in so many of these plays is the devastation that their own divisions and conflicts produces? Yes, I think that's true. Although I would, I would add that I think the devastation comes, I mean, it's, this is a very good autumn to be talking about this. You know, the devastation comes from the inability of the combatants to hear each other. You know, that's, that's why it's devastating, if, you know, in the way that you mean. The reason that there are dead bodies at the end of the play is not that they disagree, it's that they're incapable of hearing each other in a meaningful way. That's why the, the conflict between Antigone and, and her uncle is a, they are in, in a sense doublets, you know, the one of the other. We tend to heroize Antigone because of our own experience of politics in the 20th century, but I think the Greeks would have raised as much of an eyebrow about her uh, as they do about Creon. In fact, Creon, I might, I, I'd like to point out, is the only character in Greek tragedy who actually changes his mind. There is a point in the play before there are dead bodies where he says, oh my God, I've been a complete idiot. Go save Antigone. Of course, by then it's too late. But, so I think it's the idea of the discourse that's, that's important to tragedy, the importance of a kind of discourse which is the lifeblood of a democratic state. I am so happy to hear this reading of Antigone since I have my entire life loathed that character. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm supposed to love her, but she's just dreadful. And she is intolerant, profoundly intolerant. And also, what's the matter with Ismini? I really like Ismini. Ismini is my favorite character in Greek tragedy. But you know, I always, and there's a reason no one writes a play about Ismini. Nobody is interested in the reasonable person. <laughs> They're not, you know, they're not dramatic. Well, if you think about politics as theater, think about to shift to our own unhappy situation right now. You know, all politicians will tell you that the people who get things done are the negotiators, the one who give up X and get a little bit more Y, and all. that's how politics work, right? But they're not as dramatic as the screamers and the, 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 the you know, the people with the megaphones. So. You know, it's an interesting thing to think about, about what makes something dramatic as we see it. Although I always think that, you know, the Athenians 
went to the theater because it reminded them of politics, whereas, you know, we do the opposite. You know, we like court TV because it reminds us of drama, and I think Athenians like drama because it reminds them of the court, what happened in courts. Well, and you make a really good point when, when you say that the Athenians could look around and see who was being parodied, who was being criticized, who was being... And also see the people with whom they disagreed with in real life. You were a citizen, which of course, it's a limited democracy. You were a propertied male. But you're looking at the people you're arguing with who are your bitterest enemies, who are also in the audience. And I think that must have had a very powerful sort of real world effect on the way they experienced you know, the drama, so to speak, because those are the guys they had to talk to the next day in the enclesia, in the assembly. I'm, s I'm sitting here imagining a kind of um, Antigone with contemporary figures, and of course, I mean, there are so many well, options. Let's draw up a list, you know. Let's draw up a list, <coughs> but, and it is interesting that we, for the most part, don't do anything like that, much less in a context in which the immediate uh, parallels would be present. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, there is, especially for political theorists, a constant tendency to say, oh, the Greeks are us. The Greeks are kind of the original us. They are, a Greek democracy is our democracy. <laughs> and yet, when one reads Greek plays or reads about the Greeks, I think they seem radically alien. Yeah, they are alien. I mean, I think all honest classicists, let's call it, acknowledge and foreground the fact that, and, you know, on the one hand, many of the institutions to which we have attachments and from which our own institutions are clearly descended um, uh, are great. You know, the concept in Athenian thought of isegoria, right, that every citizen has an equal right to speak. It's a radical and fascinating concept at the time, as was democracy. You know, we, because at least we like to think of ourselves as a democracy, that'll last another year and a half, um, uh, you know, we, we, we get excited about the notion that this is our ancestor. And of course, as I just pointed out, there are many respects in which the Greeks are radically different, starting with their concept of who got to be a citizen. So I think it's always important to foreground the, the radical differences. You know, we can hold two concepts in our head at the same time, I think. We can, we can acknowledge the extent to which many of these innovations were admirable, were innovative, were the beginning of a sort of genealogy from which we benefit. And there are many repellent aspects of Greek civilization. You have to sort of take the whole, the whole thing. As you know, democracy was always under threat. We think of it as being inevitable because we're the beneficiary is to some extent. I mean, Greek democracy, but you know, their democracy was always under threat. The old aristocratic clans who were incredibly powerful were always looking for ways to get rid of it. It was a radical, crazy experiment. And so it's, you know, it's inevit inevitability was, was not clear at the time. And in fact, one could also say that one of the things that we see dramatized, political things that is dramatized in Greek tragedy is precisely, this is something that's so, I think, incredibly important right now when we have seen in our own polity the dangers of uh, demagogy come closer than we've ever experienced it. You know, one of the things that tragedy works out by having these sort of heroes who are bigger than us and appealing and and um, charismatic, you know, Oedipus, for example, is what do you do with these people? You know, that's, that's sort of a question that a lot of tragedy poses. What do you do with these people who command a sort of worshipful attitude on the part of people who are supposed to be free? How do you relate the dynamic individual to the larger community? I would say that's one of the great preoccupations of Athenian tragedy and one could imagine how it was experienced in a system that only lasted a couple of hundred years and in which the threat of powerful, charismatic aristocrats 
P.S. like Heracles himself, who was a Rockefeller, you know, and what, how do you, how do you integrate these people? What is the relationship between the individual and the group? So these are all political questions, and tragedy figures out a way to dramatize them in a way that makes it fun to think about. Or to bring them low. Yeah. Which is yeah, not, well. not any. I wanted to ask, you were speaking at the beginning, um, and you quoted that, that uh, saying of Cyrus, Cyrus that the Agora was the place where liars come to lie to each other. When I, when I was just beginning my dissertation, I realized that when people lie, it's because it's important. Nobody lies about trivial things. When people tell lies, it real, they're lying about something that matters. And I wondered if I could get you to talk about that a little bit, about because often it is our enemies, especially an enemy like Cyrus, who, according to Xenophon, was an eminently admirable enemy. Right. They have some good insights. So tell us about the lying. Well, it's, I mean, again, to sort of pull it in the direction of, of, of tragedy, you know, the, I would say what's most, the lie that is most interesting in the tragic imagination is the self-delusion. The lies that we tell ourselves, which I would venture to say can be among the most dangerous. You know, tragedy again and again shows you characters who have an idea about themselves, which turns out disastrously not to be true, that, that sort of is a, is a poison in the well that spreads outward. Again, the most famous example of that is Oedipus. Um, so, so tragedy is interested in truth, or in the tragic imagination, the delusion, which is a form of lying, I guess, um, is the most dangerous. Look, these are the Greeks. Know thyself, right? You know, that there is, it is interesting that this is a culture that at least pays lip service to the idea of uh, being clear about oneself. Uh, and that the lack of self-knowledge is a kind of virus that infects the city. And I think one could easily teach the Oedipus in that way, it is, it is lack of understanding. And I don't mean the fact that he doesn't know that he's his wife's son and he killed his father in the first recorded incident of road rage. Um, but, but I mean, he thinks, I don't mean that, I don't mean not knowing, I mean deluding. He thinks he's a reasonable person. He talks at the beginning of the play about, you know, I am Oedipus the Great, and I solved the riddle of the Sphinx, and I'm this brilliant guy. And yet, he, in fact, is shown throughout the play to be subject to ungovernable rage all the time. So, so the, it, it's true. Also, I don't know how smart he can be if, you know, presumably 20 years of marriage and nobody ever looked at his feet. Um, but, but, so I think the idea of, of Delusion, you know, is very interesting to tragedy. I think, I think lying is less interesting in a way, you know, than, than self-lying, so to speak. Well, go on to delusion because the Bacchae is also, the tragedy yeah. there is a, is a tragedy of delusion. It's not, that, it's not that she's lying or anyone is lying to her, Agave, but she is deluded. And it is, that is a, you I mean, think... When she kills her son. Oh, yeah. Well, that's another. Well, I was thought. Well, I, uh, uh, yeah, it happens. Um, the, especially on the Athenian stage, the, the, what I think in the Bacchae, what is interesting is, again, the, the murder or, or the ritual dismemberment of the son by the mother is done in the throes of an ecstatic uh, madness. So that's, that is sort of get you off in court, so to speak, right? That's, that's the insanity plea. But well, what's- They're in the theater. Yeah, no, 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 right. But I think what's interesting to Euripides is actually the, here again, the self-delusion of, Pentheus, 
the king who thinks he's in control, who thinks he's interested in control, not only that he's in control, he thinks he's interested in, co in control, although what the play reveals is his, is his subconscious desire to be out of control. So here again, I think one of the fascinating things about tragedy is, is its interest in the way we fool ourselves. I think that's ultimately, there is a political implication, obviously, you know, of that. Yes, and a very interesting one in on that score because his lack of control, one of the themes that you've identified as being a central source of con conflict in Athens is kinship versus, let's say, the city or the polity. And indeed, there is no polity on earth, that I, at least that I could think of, in which that is not to this day an issue. But We're seeing, right, we see it play not out. Not Pentheus. I mean, Pentheus is about a much more radical kind of disorder, yes? Right, right. I mean, Pentheus is, a, I mean, the Bacchae is a kind of a psychological study, one could say. I don't, I don't think, except by extension, it's political in the way that some of these other plays I've been discussing are political. But I do think, to sort of come back to our subject of friendship and philia and kinship groups and all of that, that, you know, so much of tragedy is interested in dramatizing what happens when an intense affinity for the kinship group gets in the way of the proper functioning of the state. And I, in fact, wrote my own dissertation about two not very good plays of Euripides um, called The Children of Heracles and The Suppliant Women, which are not great dramas, but they're also very interested in sort of contrasting behaviors that are uh, beneficial to the state and, and which are abstract, that, you know, they're based on an abstract allegiance to the state versus, and they're always contrasted in the second half of the play with a character who acts out of this narrow, uh, intense allegiance to the clan group. And so again, what are we seeing? This, this problem against which level of philia are you interested in? And as we know, you know, it's hard to get people to feel an allegiance to an abstraction because the other kinds of things are very powerful. The clan, the, the state, the team, the, you know, that's why we have these things to sort of let out these kinds of emotions which are very powerful and primitive and they're very hard to trump, no pun intended. You know, they're very hard to get around, but we, we're seeing it fold out in American politics, and in fact, global politics right now. So how do you get people to feel an allegiance, a philia, for something that is not tangible, democracy, you know, whatever the value may be? It's very hard, and we've seen in recent years in American politics a regression, I think it's safe to say, to this other kinds of things. Um, so I think what the Greeks are interested in is, once again, very urgent to us in our own politics. And I think some of these plays do a very good job of, of concentrating the dilemma in a dramatic fashion that, that leaves a very strong impression on us. And they, they do have, I mean, one of my favorite Euripides plays, is, which is a very minor one, I think, Hecuba. She gives a wonderful speech about power. But I am getting greedy, and you all have, should have a chance for questions. Uh, are, there, are, there, um, are there people with microphones out there? You are the, or the microphone, OK. So um, yes? No, you are the pink shirt, and I've forgotten your name. But it's you. <laughs> um, thank you. So this morning, also, uh, enmity or um, the status of the enemy came up a lot and uh, one of the things that I thought was really beautifully posed with the Ajax in particular right was the reversal question it's easy enough to see how friends become enemies it's really hard the interesting thing about the Ajax of course is that Odysseus is capable of this great magnanimity once his enemy is dead right so the que to, to form it as a question essentially um, is is the lesson, so obviously I think the, 
the impetus or desire of the presentation of tragedy and philia that, that you've presented is the possibility that the cathartic element of tragedy is not about these emotional, not this emotional processing that we often related to we moderns or whatever, but is rather uh, democratic citizens learning how to make friends of enemies. But um, I guess, does tragedy seem to teach us that ever? Like how, how a living enemy could become a, a friend? And then if not, is that like a limitation of the Greeks that we can improve upon? Or is there something about the tragic insight that unfortunately, like, they're nailing it, if you see what I mean, that, that in fact it's only after death. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I, I first want to address your, uh, your observation, which is true, that Odysseus is, you know, can, as it were, afford to be generous at the end of the play because Ajax is dead, although it occurs to me that even in the very first lines of the play, he has qualms about Athena's, uh, 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 you know, spiteful, uh, uh, action against Ajax. So it's very interesting that even at the beginning, even though at the you know they are bitter enemies at the beginning of the play, he's already concerned. So I think one could maybe make an argument that what happens over the course of the play is he is that concern sort of blossoms in a way into an appreciation that there is maybe it's not worth it in in some sense. I do think that tragedy illustrates usual by, by opposition. You know, tragedy shows us the negative results of a failure to do something, you know, rather than showing us how things all work out. Although, as we know, there are tragedies with happy endings. It's worth remembering, including one, I mean, I, I wouldn't say the Heracles has a happy ending. There are dead bodies all over the stage, but, but it's a remarkable play, I think. Um, and that's a play, I think, where the possibility that things can change while you're still alive is jangled before the Athenian audience in, a, in I think, a kind of radical way. I think it's a, it's a very remarkable play. And the discussion, the explicit references to philia and philoi, I think, are very striking in that play because the, and of course, it's not an accident. You know, my own dissertation advisor from Zeitlin wrote a great deal about the, the way in which Athenian tragedy is never, almost never set in Athens. It always displaces the problems onto other cities. And the only time Athens makes an appearance in place is to save the day, basically. So that's, I mean, it may be self-aggrandizing, but it is a positive gesture. I mean, they at least think that doing things their way is an improvement over the other ways. So it's a it's it's a very good question, and I I think you know it's worth discussing further at at some point. I'm supposed to look for students. Who's a student? Need a young boy. Nah. All right. I'll take you. <laughs> very interesting to hear you talking about the role that Greek tragedy had in maintaining Athenian democracy and kind of training the, the Greek people. Do you see any modern day corollaries to this or can you imagine how this could play a role in our, in our current democracy and in solving our problems? Well, I think, you know, the, the advantage that Athens has had is that it was small. You know, and I think I think one could certainly make an, an argument that democracy works better in smaller polities. You know, one of the things that one sees historically is that democracies expand into republics and keep expanding. They usually the fruit gets rotten and they fall off the tree and they become whatever they end up becoming empires. Um, but I think in the in in you know with respect to your question, I can't imagine a form of mass entertainment today that is comparable with respect to actually enacting anything worthwhile, so to speak. I mean, I got, you know, I'm a TV critic, among other things, and I watch a lot of mass entertainment, and, but I don't think, 
the idea of the sort of connectedness that I think one felt in a performance of Greek tragedy, whether negative or positive, it's, I would think it's hard to think of something. I mean, I think there was probably a time in American civilization where movies functioned to some extent. I think of a, so I think of a movie like Casablanca, which seems to express a sort of a fantasy of what the, the American is, what an American person is, that I think probably at the time most people would have subscribed to. So I think it, it's possible, but right now, I, I would not be optimistic. And again, I think it's because of the size, the size issue, <clears throat> so to speak, makes it much harder to get that kind of cohesiveness. Because all Athenian citizens, whether they were to the left or the right or the middle, had a strong sense of identification as Athenian citizens. You know, that was an important thing to be uh, in a way that I, do not think is any more the case, certainly with us today. Yes, you. Don't look tentative. It was you. <laughs> yes, her. <clears throat> Thanks. And I'm not a student. That wasn't <laughs> obvious. Um, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And I was thinking very much along the same lines. So I'm glad you called on me because it was kind of a piggyback question because I couldn't help but think about, as you were talking about this sort of load bearing role of tragedy in Greek polity, about Aristotle's analysis of the emotions um, and especially his analysis of negative emotions and the role that negative emotions play in causing people to be future focused and needing to deliberate about what to do. And so I was kind of wondering if there's a connection there yeah. between evoking negative emotions and then evoking negative emotions in such a way that they would be shared across groups of people who may otherwise disagree. Because of course, for Aristotle, emotions are a form of proof, but they're a form of proof that come within the individual human. They, they, we, we experience them as though they're arising up within us. And so something seems to us to have been proven when it evokes emotions for us. So I'm wondering, Maybe if, if there's a way of thinking about that reality within Greek polity as a way of thinking forward about maybe analogies or other ways that it, there might be a, a tether of, of relevance without maybe reducing it to entertainment, because it, the analogy would have to be different, right? It, yeah. wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the same, especially because entertainment now has a tendency to isolate us rather than to join us. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if there might be some raw material there. Well, I mean, I think you provided the answer for your own query, actually, which is, I think it's a very interesting idea. So when we usually think about Aristotle, emotions, and tragedy, what we think of is the poetics and this idea of catharsis, which nobody knows what he actually meant. Um, but the idea that in some way that the, the intensity, not, it, maybe not the negativity, but the intensity, the emotion, is somehow purgative. Uh, but I like very much the idea of what you're drawing attention to, that just the exposure to the negative emotion makes us want to solve, solve the problem, do the, do the thing. Um, and I think in that sense, the tragedy makes perfect sense because all it does is show you people either have, well, it shows you people having negative emotions and not solving their problems in a way that I think by implication is meant to expose us to the negative emotions, but because we are distanced by our spectatorship gets us to think about it in a, in a more rational way. So I think, you know, there's something to be done. I think there's something to be done with that in a very interesting way. You know, it goes to something very interesting, and here I'm putting on my critic's hat, um, about the way that we feel about serious versus unserious drama. You know, the, the Aristotelian bias has stayed with us, right? We, you know, I don't think anyone really believes that a rom-com tells you anything about rom, you know, in a serious way, but we do feel that it is the exposure to the minor chords that get us thinking. So I think there's something kind of interesting implicit in your question about the relationship of entertainment to negativity. 
that is worth thinking about. And I think there's also another, there's possibly a political ramification of that because in a negative way, that, you know, in our own political discourse, I think we refrain from, as it were, constructive negativity in the way that your, the beginning of your question suggested might be useful. You know, we are, we sell happy talk, we, we, we encourage fantasies about what we are and who we are and what we've done. We're seeing this play out right now in a very interesting way when, with this whole book banning thing. You know, so the, it's that as if the exposure to things that are difficult or negative will, will have a negative effect, which as we know is actually not true, if you see what I'm saying. So I don't know, I think there's all kinds of very interesting applications of your observation. <clears throat> no, the orange, orange sweatered person. Yes, hi. Um, my question actually relates to this um, opposition of the enemy friend um, idea. And you mentioned something that in the Greek, the tragedies, um, the characters are pitted against each other. So you kind of were referring to that agonal spirit, which I think, if I remember correctly, um, Arendt identifies as the downfall of the Greek polis. So the question is whether the characters are actually competitors or whether they're enemies, and also whether we can actually see enemies as opposing to friends, because in my understanding, it's more indifference rather than enemies. So I'm sorry, the, the, your final... My final question is whether they are actually competitors or enemies, and whether there is actually this opposition of enemy and friend, because in both cases, we actually care about the other, we have a relationship to the other. Um, so yeah, or whether... The, op the opposite of friendship is actually indifference. Right, I see what you're saying. It's very interesting. Uh, I th I'm wondering sort of if you could say that what tragedy quite often shows us is the way that competition, which can be healthy and is certainly healthy in the life of the polis, and of course, as we know, nobody was more competitive than the Greeks, right? They prided themselves on everything they did became a competition, including tragedy, which as you know, there were prizes and you know, they couldn't even walk to the bathroom without having a prize. Um, so I think, no, but I mean, I think it's interesting what you're saying because I think one of, maybe one of the things that tragedy dramatizes is the way that competition, which is healthy, can devolve into enmity and I would say it shows you that happening because of the failure to treat, or, or because the characters treat the competitor as an enemy, as if there is no possibility of mutuality or commonality. Because of course to be in a competition already assumes that you are sharing certain values. You're part of this, one could even say you're part of the same group. You have to be. To be enemies sets you across from each other, opposite to each other. So I'm wondering, I mean, I'm just thinking aloud because I think your comment is very stimulating, that that may be an interesting way to think of the agonistic activity that is dramatized in Greek tragedy, which is it shows the failure of competitors or the, de the devolution of competitors into enemies. And I would say it's because of a failure to be able to recognize the commonality. You know, to take an obvious example, the, you know, when I teach Antigone, everyone's always on the side of Antigone and everyone hates Creon. I always like to say that one of the things that happens to you as an aging classicist is Creon looks better and better to you as you get older. But of course, we all live in polities that find a way to balance, or often struggle to find a balance between the philia of the family and the philia of the city, the needs of the, the, the domestic sphere versus the needs of the political sphere. That's what we do on a daily basis. But one has to recognize that 
there is an interest in preserving both realms, which I would put under the, your heading of competitiveness, that they are competitive rather than being mutually exclusive. And the problem with both Antigone and Creon is they think it's mutually exclusive. You can either have a family or you can have a city. But as we know, you have to figure a way to work it out. The myth that stands behind the Oresteia dramatizes the problem. You know, when we go to war, we all sacrifice our children. That's what has to happen in a war, that the domestic sphere has to give up a member to the political sphere. The myth of the, the sacrifice of Iphigenia is just a dramatization of a political necessity. And part of the problem that the characters in the Oresteia once again have is it's always all or nothing, you know? And so I'm, I'm very taken by your notion. I, I have to think about it more, but I think you're onto something very interesting, actually. So this story between Antigone and Creon, um, as far as I remember, there's an, an older play, um, the citizen of Thebe, Theban, um, some citizen of Thebe, Theban. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of your comment. So the, the, that sorry. story between Creon and Antigone, uh, there was another play um, some centuries before the citizen of Theban, as well, far as I remember, where, where the story has a different ending. And it's not two irre irrecon irreconcilable principles that stand against each other, but they manage to somehow bury this one brother um, outside of the city. So, so they find an, a good ending in that play. Do in a Greek play? It's a Greek play, yeah. It's a Greek play. Heiner Müller, uh, the, the German uh, writer Heiner Müller, he wrote about it, um, comparing that play, which is much older and less known, and um, Antigone, um, and he he had the a historical conclusion conclusion that uh, some centuries before the democracy was in a better state, and they didn't need that conflict to be so uh, um, um, unsolvable. Well, I I have to say I'm racking my brains to think of what play might be. I mean, there's a play by Euripides that imagines a different ending to the Oedipus story, in which. No, Jocasta it's the, it's doesn't. The so, so with the two brothers, and they find a grave for him outside of the city. I don't remember whether Antigone has to die or not, but they find a grave. I'll yeah. check. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't. I'm just blanking on what on what this play might be. Um, the, sit, the title is this, "The Citizen of Theban." No, not that's not a title. Well, she I told us the story. So I know that's this, good enough. Um, but it's good to know. I'm glad <laughs> somebody wrote it. I think, I don't know. I'll have to check and I'll get back to you. I can't think offhand what that might be. Yes, great in the middle. Don't ask Marina. She's just a troublemaker. <laughs> this woman, yes. In the middle. Yeah, the in the black. I don't know who wrote it. It's Marie. Right. Yes, you, you. <laughs> Woman in the middle. Um, I guess I want to bring up something that might like, not be very popular in these days. There's to say the political, the apolitical, and the anti-political. We know what Hannah Arendt said about love, we know what she said about hate, we know she, what she said about violence, she said all of them were anti-political. So I'm, I'm just interested in kind of the terminology and the way that we're thinking about uh, Philoi as political. Um, and I would love to hear more about tragedy in its most primitive meanings, um, which have to do with sacrifice, Dionysius, satyrs, the maenads. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, um, 
it's pretty crazy. I have always felt from Edith Hamilton on that something was missing. <laughs> something was missing in the way to understand these, um, these Greek myths, and I, I don't understand them at all, despite years of Edith Hamilton. <laughs> um, but I just keep thinking about Sloterdijk's book, Rage and Time, and, and Ken Yeti on Sacrifice, and even somebody like Julian Jaynes, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And approaches that actually kind of sideline the political as we think of it today. What's going on right now, everyone thinks of as political. For instance, what's happening in, um, in Israel and, and Gaza. I think people think this is political, but I think for Hannah Arendt, this is not the political. It's not the political for a thinker like Marshall McLuhan. The politics for him, as everyone will recall, is, is a process of challenge, contest, and negotiation. And so I just want to hear how, I don't know, I think I've seen it also as a theme throughout the day, um, intersubjectivity, and I think even in terms of friendship, we have to reject this, this notion, which I think is very late. I, I, don't, I just, I don't know how political um, a tragedy can actually be, I guess is my question. I'm gonna stop because, um, but you, you see what I mean, that the notion of politics in light of this extreme violence, whether in the form of love, hate, bloodshedding, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see how those are actually, um, I'm well, I think sure that I think that the answer is just that tragedy is interested in the processes and is always exploring the currents that occur between people who disagree, to put it in a very basic way. And by dramatizing the various kinds of discourse that can exist, both positive and negative, between people, and I'm coming back to your notion here, who ought to be sharing uh, a common space, even if they disagree, and showing us both negative and positive models of how to deal with that, it is participating in a political, in essentially a political discourse. Uh, I would say that the fact that so many tragic plots devolve into violence is, is political in that it shows you uh, what happens when proper discourse fails. So I'm, I think that's how I would uh, address your question. Do we have time for one we more? We have one more question. Any student? Come on. Do me a solid. Um, any, a, any, no, is that a student? Yes. Are you a student? I love Can you, you show your okay. ID? No, you have saved my reputation with Roger here. Wait, can you sorry, start over sorry. again here? Um, just on your comment, oh, sorry. Just on your comment about tragic events leading to violence, and that shows when proper discourse fails. What um, what happens when like proper discourse happens? Or kind of what's the other side to violence? I did join the talk later, so sorry if it's been covered. Um, does that make sense? I, I can't hear what you're oh. saying, actually. Um, uh, what's the opposite to violence, when, with violence being when proper discourse fails, what happens when proper discourse works? Or what would you kind of say is the counter perspective argument to that comment you just made? So what, what happens in tragedy when it doesn't end in violence? Yeah, or is that just not the case in tragedy? Because then it's not. Well, I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> it's not very common. Um, is after all tragedy, but uh, well, I think I'm trying to think of the tragedies that don't end in violence. Um, the, I mean, the tragedies that, it's interesting because in each of the tragedies, 
There, there are three plays by Euripides called The Romances, and they, they come close to violence because of all the things we've been talking about, self-delusion, people failing to communicate in a healthy way with one another, and the, the action is sort of yanked away from the precipice of violence. It's interesting, actually, your question, because it's usually because of the intervention of a, a deus ex machina saves the day just as the, as the plot is about to go in the direction of violence and destruction. And I think maybe that's just a reinforcement of what I was saying before, that tragedy is interested in failure rather than success. I mean, the point of these plays is that the normal processes can't end in success. You have to have a divine intervention. And I think, again, to connect a few of the dots, that tragedy has to show you pictures of failure or bring you close to failure as a way of stimulating your awareness of, of the issues that you should be thinking about in a way that will not lead to failure. I think that's how it works. That's about as hopeful as we could that's about as subject. hopeful as a panel on tragedy is ever going to get. <laughs>